Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Friday advocacy update starting precisely at 12.08 uh, p.m. <laughs> this Friday. As Dr. Hyme mentioned, I'm Austin Harris. I'm the Director of Member Engagement here at KASB, and I'm uh, joined today on Zoom by our fantastic advocacy services team, uh, Mark Tallman, our Associate Executive Director of Adv Advocacy, Scott Rothschild, who's our Communications Editor, and Leah Flyter, who's our Director of Governmental Relations. So we're excited to be with you this afternoon. Uh, we've had a busy couple of weeks in the world of educational advocacy, uh, and because of that, we've got a jam-packed show for you today. There's a lot of content for us to cover, uh, including this week's State, of, uh, State Board of Education meeting, some federal legislation around COVID-19 and the CARES Act, upcoming elections, and a whole lot more. So we're going to move quick. Uh, everyone's going to get a chance to talk, but as we go, if you've got some questions for the speakers, go ahead and drop those into the chat. I'll be watching that and we'll try to answer your questions as they come in. And of course, if we get to the end of today and you still have some questions, you can always email any of us and we'll do our best to give you a short, succinct and accurate answer. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into it. Mark, Scott, we'll start today with the State Board of Education who met this week and covered a whole lot of ground. And a lot of what they discussed was rooted in the communal response to COVID-19. So as we know, uh, last spring, right after spring break, uh, schools were closed by the governor and the entire state shifted to remote learning for the remainder of that school year. And of course, in those moments that created a lot of, lots of challenges for administrators and school boards, parents, students, everyone involved in education. Over the summer, the Department of Ed and the state board tried to find some solutions to work out some options for schools as we got into the fall. Uh, and this fall, a number of students across the state of Kansas also started their school year remotely. And so the state board spent a lot of time this week exploring the impacts of COVID-19 on education and trying to figure out how they're going to work moving forward. So Scott, Mark, can you tell us a little bit about what they heard from uh, teachers and people who were at the meeting and what they're doing to prepare for the rest of the school year as it becomes increasingly clear that we can't assume COVID-19 is going away uh, at least before January 1. Well, uh, Austin, uh, uh, everything you, you mentioned was what the State Board wanted to hear from, from teachers, uh, from the folks out in the field. And what they did is they assembled the uh, Kansas Teacher of the Year team uh, to speak to them. These are all the regional winners and of course the Kansas Teacher of the Year who of course won the National Teacher of the Year this year. So they had a very diverse group of teachers uh, from across the state, big schools, small schools, middle-sized schools. And these teachers told them that while, you know, the start of the school year has produced a lot of challenges, there has been an increase in collaboration and things like that. But, but the bottom line they said is they are, they are working as hard as they can and they are really kind of hitting the, the point of exhaustion. Uh, th this is just such a unique school year uh, and there are so many different, uh, you know, they're having to juggle so many different balls at once that they're just feeling a lot of frustration and uh, feeling that they're, they're, they're just not able to get it all done. And, and I'm sure all you school board members are hearing this kind of same thing. One of the state board members, uh, Ben Jones from Sterling, he, he does substitute teaching and he says he's, every day he sees it. You know, he goes down this teacher in the, in the school office, teachers are crying. Uh, the, the frustration level is, is pretty amazing. So the, 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 the teacher said, the state board asked them, what can we do to help? And the teacher said, anything you can do to assist in the mental health of teachers and staff would be much appreciated. They said this pandemic has exposed, just like it has in all of society, the inequities uh, out there. So anything they can do to, to uh, reduce those uh, or to focus on equity and anything policymakers could do to uh, just treat teachers as the frontline workers uh, that they are. Uh, they're, they're just under a lot of stress. So, Following this presentation and uh, uh, just an amazing group of teachers, just so dedicated to their profession, the State Board held a discussion on how they can uh, support schools and families during the pandemic. And what the board did is they, they decided to form a working group. They're gonna come back in November uh, for their monthly uh, meeting, November 10th. And they're gonna talk about maybe some 
things to look at to, to alleviate the stress on schools. They're gonna look at the 1,116 hour school requirement for instruction. They're gonna look at uh, recent grants for online learning sites. They're gonna look at the medical questions related to COVID testing. And they're gonna look at, is there anything they can do from a state board's perspective to alleviate district requirements maybe on reporting and things like that just to just to accommodate the fact that this is just such a difficult uh, year yeah so sounds like you know state board heard that there were some positives but still a lot of challenges floating out there for educators and administration uh, and students and families mark as they start to work on moving ahead and preparing for the rest of the school year what are some of the things we can expect them to work on well, you know, Scott began mentioning it and, you know, may, may want to take just a moment to kind of think about where we are from the beginning, you know, there, I think everyone agreed, you've got two goals, really. Um, you want to get as many kids as possible back to in person learning, because that's what works best for most kids. And you want to be as safe as possible. Right. And the problem is, we found that even though you have to try to do both, it is really, really, really difficult to do both because it's hard to do one thing as fast as possible and be as safe as possible. And one of the things I think the commissioners talked about and others, you know, last spring when this happened, everyone was, let's, let's just get to May, kind of get through the school year and, and then we'll be able to look at reopening. And then over the summer, everyone was working, well, let, let's get to August to get things back to normal. Well, things aren't going well. So some people said, let's put it back to Labor Day so we can get ready. And then, well, let's put it back to the middle of the semester. And, and what the commissioner has said is, we just have to accept the fact that nobody really wanted to accept that the world we're in now is the world we're gonna be in for the rest of the year. And I think the concern is that, that a lot of people's mindsets and the way schools were operating is to say, we know there's this problem, but, but we're really hoping it goes to, away and we can get back to normal. And, and that is just not gonna happen very quickly. And the problem that people are facing now is either you continue to have all or many of your kids remote only or hybrid partly, and that has learning implications, um, or you bring you 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 get back in person, and what we're finding across the state is that inevitably is meaning interruptions for quarantining, staff being out, you know, this in and out situation that are in, and and that's also very very frustrating. So so what are we going to do about it? Well, you know, Scott mentioned a couple things, and it may be worth noting a little bit what the state board has tried to do. You know, they put out the whole thousand page navigating change document. And, and I think some people felt that helpful and some people again were kind of hoping they wouldn't have to worry about it. Um, they just changed within the last month the, the, the limits on um, they have to keep students keeping logs because that didn't seem to be working. They the, at this board meeting removed the hour limits on substitute teachers so that you know we could try to remove that problem. They voted to allow districts to really put off this year, if you were planning to come into the accreditation cycle, you could put that off a year. So you didn't have to juggle that. And, and I think what the commissioner's message, and two weeks ago he spoke to this group, is to say, you know, you, you, you're, you're going to do everything you can to bring people back, but keep that distance. So if that means using other facilities in your community, you know, and it, w that's what some districts have found they've have to do. Okay, to bring people back, we just can't do it and have the spacing so can we find other facilities where that will happen you know scott mentioned one of the things that has come up is the question of looking at the minimum school term which drives a lot so that is statutory but the state board has the ability to do waivers one of the so one of the things that has been suggested is well let's let's give districts the ability to kind of take some more time off to, to, re, to retool, you know, to figure out we're having problems with hybrid. How could we do it different? The you know, problem is if, if you take more time off, you may run up against that. If the state board gives flexibility, of course, though, taking more time off to replan is sending kids back home, which is exactly what there's so much opposition to. So that's something they're going to be struggling through. 
the whole issue of seat time versus competencies is also tied up into this because a lot of the idea behind the, the navigating change was to let you look at what is the essential things for kids to learn. But I think what we've heard is a lot of people are still struggling to Im implement that. And there remains this overriding question of the legislature's role because they're the one that sets the calendar. And the big bucket that they're going to have to deal with is this question of local control versus state control. Because like it or not, we're now in an environment where pretty much all these decisions have to come back to the local school district. The legislature you know, took away the governor's ability to have statewide orders on school closings, good or bad, that now with the state board, they didn't agree with one of her decisions. Counties can opt out of most health rules. And, and right now, I think we're operating under the assumption that that means the governor's order on masks and all of that can be a local choice back to the local board. And the attorney general has even suggested that local boards can use their home rule powers to do more than most people thought were possible. So we're in this situation where we've given local boards a lot of authority, but then there's a great deal of frustration because they're using that in different ways. And so now people can say, well, my board's doing this, but this board's doing something different. So what, what controls all that? Many of you have probably already heard this. The problem for the state board is they need to make the decision, should they try to step in and provide more, guide, more stronger guidance or clearer guidance? Part of what the state board talked about is maybe inconsistencies in quarantine policies. Are we being too strict? Are we trying to keep too many kids out? Um, all, so I'm, I'm only telling you that these are the kind of things that were discussed, but whether it comes back to any specific sets of policies, I guess that's something that you as school leaders need to be thinking about and communicating with your, your, uh, uh, your state board member or us. And remember, many of these decisions are also going to be back in front of the legislature when it comes back because we know that the legislature is gonna be taking up the whole Emergency Management Act. Right now, that law really doesn't say much about education, but with all this controversy, there's gonna be discussions, I think, about what schools can do, can't do, options for parents if schools don't do what some people want them to do. So this whole issue is something that we're really going to need to be, uh, to be thinking out and working through. You know, KSB, one of our guiding principles has always been local control, but it's really tough if, well, we want local control, but sometimes we don't want local control. So how do you decide where, where, where that comes down and who ought to make all, all of these decisions? So just, I guess, encourage you to be thinking through your local experience. I believe we're posting today in, in my, my blog, we're going to have a report out where we've kind of tried to give a statewide perspective of what's going on. But as always, that's a top level view. You need to be looking at what's happening in your district, um, kind of maybe use that as a guide to work through some of these issues and have that communication with your constituency and your local, uh, local elected officials who represent you. Yeah, Mark's got a great new blog out on the challenges that have faced and are continuing to face school districts in response to COVID-19. You can find the link to that in the chat. Mark, you think part of the challenge for folks is that not many of the problems you talked about are new challenges. Um, most of these are carryovers from the spring and the fall and the early part of the summer. So it's a lot of the same challenges that we just can't seem to get answers to. Uh, but not everything the state board talked about was bad news. There was some uh, highlights in there. Talk to us a little bit about teacher supplies and the report that came out around teachers and substitute teachers with the state board. You know, this is something that I think uh, maybe was a little bit surprising. It comes with a caution that some of this data, you know, is, is based on reports that, that may be a little shaky because everyone is struggling and scrambling to report. But what, what the board heard is that the actual number of unfilled positions across the state is less this fall than it was last fall. I think that surprised a lot of people who felt that because of you know, the pandemic concerns, we'd have a lot more resignations and difficulty bringing people in. Right now, that doesn't seem to be the case. One thing that clearly uh, seems to have made a difference, and some of you have been parts of discussions for several years now about, so 
what options should there be for, for non-traditional educated teachers? Um, and the state board, I think, has been very responsive about coming up with alternative paths, but still under some supervision. So it's not just open the doors and let people come in, but different and more flexible ways to get restricted license or temporary license. And so we've had uh, uh, th those over the last four or five, six years, those numbers have really grown and they've helped offset the fact that the number of new teachers coming out of traditional programs has been shrinking. So again, kind of the good news is we've offset some of the anticipated losses. That's been positive. The other thing that I think keeps surprising people, once again, we have more teachers coming into Kansas from out of state than leaving Kansas for other states. You know, we sometimes hear this, we're, we're losing teachers to other states. That just seems to continue to not, not really be the case. And it was noted, and some of this is, is thanks to you and your negotiations with local teachers and legislative funding, we've been able to increase salaries better <laughs> in the last several years uh, than in the previous eight. That may be helping. But the final caution in this area is um, everything that Scott said at the outset, the reports of teacher burnout, frustration, you know, me mental challenges because of the stress uh, is, is very real. And that me may mean a year of trying to do this could create implications for next year. And the other thing was several board members and others noted that um, we may be doing better than we thought with teachers, but other, other positions, you know, cooks and bus drivers and some of those other positions, many districts say they are still really struggling. Yeah, certainly something to keep an eye on as we move through the rest of this year and into the next school year. One of the other things that COVID-19 really highlighted for us was a disparity in internet access for our Kansas students. Uh, Leah, you've been tracking broadband expansion really since the beginning of this conversation months ago, but when schools switched to a completely remote system, uh, we kind of realized what had been true the entire time that a number of Kansas communities don't have access to high speed, high quality internet and that's a problem for kids who are trying to do education at home. Big news was made in that area, at least in the state of Kansas last week, uh, Governor Kelly opening up a new Office of Bra Broadband Development. So Leah, why don't you tell us a little bit more about that office, what the goal of it is, and what it might mean for some of our local schools. Well, Austin, the governor issued that executive order establishing that Office of Broadband Development in order to help the state achieve universal broadband coverage. And uh, we know from our members that broadband internet and making it more affordable is one of the biggest challenges that you face statewide. And in June, I think you all know that a study found that 156,000 Kansas kids, that's about a third of our enrolled students, don't have reliable broadband access. So this office will hopefully facilitate that transition to universal broadband access and help get all of our kids online. Along those lines, the governor announced that same day uh, the funding of 67 projects uh, to the tune of $49 million that will help connect about 77,000 households and about 600 what they call anchor institutions, which for our purposes is schools, uh, also libraries and hospitals. And uh, that funding came from the CARES Act. So that's about $49 million in CARES Act funding that the state SPARC task force recommended be funneled to those projects. And the State Finance Council, which includes Governor Kelly and legislative leadership, uh, approved that, that funding. And so those grant announcements do include some projects that will directly benefit schools and students. So that's, that's good news. And uh, as a result, KESB President Lori Blake issued a statement applauding the governor for that executive order and for this, this goal of universal broadband access. And she, she noted it's a, it's a significant step in closing the homework gap, but it's important work that's gonna take some continued and concerted effort by a lot of dedicated Kansans, including uh, our very own Lou Martino, who's up in the left corner of my screen, who is, on a personal quest to badger Aji Pai until he helps us with broadband access, right? <laughs> so keep up the good work, Lou. <laughs> so that was good news last week. 
Yeah, good news. Certainly the, the fight for broadband access for all of Kansas, not over yet, but a step in the right direction. That's right. Yeah, we and also, I'll oh, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I, I think I want to, you know, I was thinking about this. It's really important that this doesn't come across as we're finally getting, we're going to close that homework gap at about the time we decide that online learning doesn't work. Right. <laughs> um, there, there, there has to be a balance between understanding that I think the frustration is online work, online learning does not work for all kids all the time. But for some kids, it works very well, and it can, it can be a part, an important part, of learning for every child. So I think that's what we have to kind of stress. That's right. That, you know, and should we ever get past this COVID challenge, you know, in, in, in regular life, there are still many kids in Kansas who need to be able to go home and do their homework by accessing some sort of internet or some sort of, you know, you know, some sort of server from their school so that they can get into that, tap into it, and do their homework, do their assignments online. It's part of learning to be a 21st century citizen, and whether, yeah, whether it's remote learning or just in a new normal future, broadband internet is just absolutely critical for Kansas students. Yeah, Mark, your point's well taken. You know, we focus on broadband from the uh, avenue of education, but it's certainly much bigger than that, and access to high quality internet is important to all Kansans, not just students, teachers, and educators. So this is a big step uh, in a number of ways as that's we continue right. to seek that. So that's a, a great update, Leah. We also heard a little bit about some funding opportunities coming from the Children's Cabinet. They've opened up grant applications. Uh, Leah, can you walk us through what that new grant sure. program is and how schools can apply? Yeah, sure. Speaking of frustration with online or remote learning, um, we do know that there are problems with uh, parents having to go back to work and meanwhile their kids are in you know full remote or hybrid learning models and so the Kansas Children's Cabinet has announced this week uh, that it has 40 million dollars in grants available to community organizations including schools and their partners who want to provide some supervised online learning sites for kids to attend so that kids will be safe they'll be supervised you know they'll be fed they can go to this site, they can do their online learning on those remote or hybrid days, and their parents can go to work and know that the kids will be properly taken care of and supervised while they're doing their remote learning. And so that is something, that, again, that was made possible by the CARES Act and the SPARC Task Force. The, uh, the types of organizations that are uh, eligible for the grants are, of course, our KDHE licensed, you know, early child care centers, but also schools. YMCA's, Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, those of you who might have 21st century learning communities in your schools, those would be um, eligible entities. And really any other community organizations who think that they would like to or would be able to provide that supervised online learning site are encouraged to apply. So this, this could be a real step forward for our parents and our schools who are continuing to to try to react to this problem and so you would want to go to the kansas children's cabinet and trust fund if you just look that up on uh, the internet and then if you that'll be their homepage. and if you look kind of on the bottom right there's a square there for uh remote learning support grants and that is the link uh, that you can use to uh, begin applying for those grants. So a great opportunity, and it, it seems to me that it's a, it's designed to apply to uh, appeal and to be eligible to a large array of community partners. And so I would encourage all of you to to investigate that and maybe uh, investigate that with your community partners that you're already working with or would like to work with. Yeah, and if you have a hard time finding the link to that application process, we've attached it to several of our news briefs about That's the correct. grants. Um, so you can find that in our newsroom, in our emails, or on social media. And of course, you can always reach out to us for help in right. finding those resources. That's right. And you know, Austin, speaking of the CARES Act, um, I know it's been challenging for a lot of folks that these, uh, these projects under the law have to be obligated and the money has to be spent by December 30th of this year. Right. And so we wanted to give people a heads up. Um, our Kansas senators, Jerry Moran and Pat Roberts, introduced a bill earlier this month that would extend that deadline, that CARES Act deadline, 
to December 31st, 2022. It does not appropriate any more money, but it would extend the deadline. And I know, Lou, I agree. You know, we, we have a thumbs up. The issue is going to be that, you know, we've got Congress out campaigning right now, and they will be back in a little bit off and on after the election, but it may, the best chance for this to maybe be enacted, say in a end of the year, you know, appropriations agreement may not be until December, you know, and so it's a, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny sign of good news. But in the meantime, I think if you've got one of those projects, I think you better just operate as if you need to spend that money by the end of December but just be aware that this measure is out there. I brought it to the attention of our NSBA lobbyists in Washington, DC. They are gonna be hitting it pretty hard when they go to their congressional meetings. So, so we have a little bit of hope there, but I don't want anybody to think that this is a done deal. So again, I would proceed at this point as if you need to spend that money, but be aware that that's out there. And if you happen to have any interactions with your members of Congress here over the next few weeks, um, I would, you know, tell them that we support that. And that certainly is something that we know educators and of course, all of the other uh, community stakeholders who are also accessing CARES Act funding would really appreciate the extension of that deadline. Yeah. Mr. Tallman, do you have something to add to the end of that? Uh, just a, just a sarcastic comment that it's <laughs> kind of like knowing when your term paper is due and being told you might get an extension. You might get an extension. No, yeah. if you're getting the extension until the day it's due. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. So here's your parent going, <laughs> keep working on that term paper. Yeah. It can turn into a real high stakes game of chicken if we're not careful there. Yeah. Well, Leah, that's a great update on uh, that legislation. Other news coming out of DC in the Capitol feels like we've been going back and forth for months now about whether or not we were going to get another COVID-19 relief package. Um, over the last couple of weeks, we've had lots of confusing messages on that subject. Uh, first, the president indicated that he was pulling away from those negotiations. Then a couple days later said he was back in for negotiations, but Senate Republicans have indicated they're not sure. This week, of course, leaders on both sides of the aisle are indicating that a relief package probably not going to happen before Election Day, which as of today is only 18 days away. Um, so any updates for the members on where we are on COVID-19 relief and what they might be able to expect moving forward? Well, uh, the quick update is that uh, there, it's pretty clear that we are probably not going to see, barring some kind of miracle, or, you know, we've been on the uh, Zoom now for, what, about 25 minutes or so. Something could happen in D.C., who knows? Uh -huh. But um, last night, uh, Speaker Pelosi and Treasury Secretary Mnuchin said, hey, we, we talked for 90 minutes and we made some pretty good progress. But then uh, the uh, Republican Senate leader, Mitch McConnell said, no way am I doing a, a 1.8 or $2.2 trillion bill. You know, we're, we're looking more at $500 billion. And so, and he didn't see any, any possibility of compromise into that kind of, that higher funding level. So I think, uh, like I said, unless something miraculous has happened in the last 15 or 20 minutes and who knows, it, it probably looks like we are not going to see a stimulus bill um, until after the election. And I would think probably most likely not until a new Congress comes in. Um, it's, it's uh, the challenge with that is, you know, the, uh, the, the house Democrats, they, they would like to do about mm, $182 billion for K-12. The, uh, the Senate position was about 70 billion. And in the Senate, they wanted to tie about two thirds of that money to uh, whether you would reopened in person or not. So, you know, there, there was some significant money at stake there for not only for K-12 schools, but, you know, also for some, the states and the cities who really are also seeing some revenue, just pretty serious revenue downfall. So, so it's a, it's a disappointment for folks. And of course there were stimulus checks and uh, unemployment checks also on the line. And it looks like that is, not going to happen by the election. And I'm frankly, from what we're hearing, I'd be surprised if anything happens until 2021. Yeah, seems like an awful big gap to close here in the next uh, 18 yeah, days next between the of days. House and the, and the Senate. So COVID-19 relief continues to be tough to follow, um, but maybe nothing was as tough to follow as when and how we were going to have a census deadline this year. Yes. We, you've, uh, you've been watching that closely for us. 
Um, and now we know that the deadline was yesterday. Spring it was yesterday. That's right. Um, so what happened this week and how might census data be impacting our schools and our members? Well, earlier this week, the United States Supreme Court said no more jockeying around, you know, the census must end and it must, it may not go until October 31st. So uh, the Census Bureau immediately announced uh, Wednesday, no, Thursday the 15th, October 15th is the deadline. And so uh, uh, that was uh, wrapped up yesterday. Uh, we know that um, Kansas, based on the 2010 census, Kansas received about $6 billion each year in federal funding, you know, that's, t you know, you pay those taxes to the federal government and it comes back to the state in the form of funding that is determined by your population count, which is determined by an accurate census. And so uh, funding for things like IDEA, Title I, school meals, and of course, community services, medical services, police, all kinds of programs coming from the federal government are determined by an accurate census count. So uh, everyone hopes that we, we got a pretty good count. I think the, the estimated count was pretty high. I'm not sure how it compares to 2010. Uh, I think the, um, the internet um, availability this year probably helped a lot of people. So fingers crossed, we did okay. I think our, our response rate was above 99% and tracked with the national average. So that's good. Yeah. Uh, but we'll have to see, you know, if, if we have some areas that were significantly undercounted as they were last time, you know, that's, that's going to hurt our bottom line. And also, of course, the census really helps determine, it determines how your congressional districts are drawn and how our state legislative districts are drawn. If you lose population, you know, you might lose a seat in the state legislature, and, and we've seen that over the past several years. And so that is another, another key indicator of the, of the census data is how our legislative districts are drawn. Yeah, you've done a great job tracking that for us, Lee, and we appreciate Thanks. the work you've done trying to get people engaged in that. And Mr. Tallman, looks like you'd like to jump in on the census. Only, no, I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss that <laughs> LEFW has a question about the FFCRA. And I'm really <laughs> going to hope that's a federal acronym because I don't know what it is. It's family's first coronavirus uh... And it's Lou Faust from Manhattan. Oh, then, well, okay, <laughs> Lou, don't be so anonymous. You know, I, I haven't heard anything about the FFCRA being extended, but I will double check with our legal folks who follow that, Lou, and I'll get back to you on that. You know, Leah, is it is it fair to say, and maybe Scott would want to comment, a lot of the answer to this is going to be probably determined by what happened in those 18 days. Um, if the if the Democrats win the Senate and the presidency, there you go, Lou. Very There's good. Lou. <laughs> uh, if the Demo if, if that happens, you are probably going to see a very different posture on what might be extended, what additional funding there will be. But if we remain in a divided government uh, posture as we are now, it's probably going to be very difficult for for much of anything to happen. So um, we'll we'll probably have a lot better guesses uh, in in about a month. Yeah, a lot of uh, resolution still to come here over the next couple of weeks. It'll, it'll come fast. Uh, speaking of elections, voting has officially started here in the state of Kansas. On Thursday, the Secretary of State sent out nearly half a million mail-in ballots, which blew the numbers for the last two cycles out of the water. Uh, Scott, you've been tracking the election for us. So what do we think the impact will be on turnout based on that increased number of mail-in ballots? And what things do we need to keep our eyes on as we move closer to the election? Well, Austin, that's right. I mean, the, the mail-in voting numbers are just astounding. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we've, we've had this in Kansas for quite a while, but I guess folks have gotten used to it. And uh, th they really are huge numbers. Uh, you know, usually in presidential years, we have uh, upper 60% of registered voters will vote. I think we're going to blow by that, too. Uh, obviously, the, this is a very contentious election. So, when it comes to mail-in voting, if anyone out there or any of your folks plan to mail-in vote, please do it as soon as possible. The deadline to get a, uh, uh, to send in an application for a mail-in ballot is October 27th, but really if you wait that long, the process of sending that letter in, getting a letter back, sending the ballot back, you're cutting it close because that, 
That mail-in ballot has to be postmarked by November 3rd and it has to be received by your local election office by November 6th. Advanced voting in person is going on also all over the state, but it is very, uh, some, some counties have started it already, some haven't. Shawnee County starts Monday, I believe Sedgwick County starts Monday. So you got, if you're confused about it, go to your election office website or call your election office to find out when it's starting, what places are open, what are the hours and things like that. Uh, now, of course, the presidential race, uh, the Senate race, all the federal races are sucking all the air out, but these legislative races are very, very important. Uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, in Kansas, we have seen time and time again, statewide races and legislative races determined by just, you know, handfuls of votes. So we've, we've got to get our people out. We have to support candidates that support public education. Uh, you know, obviously education is going to be front and center in, in the upcoming session for all the reasons we've been talking about these past 30 minutes. So, uh, you know, just get, get your people out. KSB has a lot of resources on our website about, you know, the candidates and, and what, what the important issues are and that kind of thing. Uh, in, in addition to the legislative races, I'll just mention real briefly, we have two contested State Board of Education races. Uh, one's in Johnson County uh, between Benjamin Hodge, Hodge, who is a former legislator, and a, uh, a Melanie Haas, who is an entrepreneur uh, up there in Overland Park. They're running for the, uh, the open seat. Steve Roberts is not running again. Uh, and the other contested state board race is down in uh, Wichita. Uh, Kathy Bush, who is the chair of the State Board of Education, is being challenged by um, a former Wichita School Board member, Betty Arnold. So uh, important legislative races. Uh, and uh, as just please get your people out to vote. And if they're going to mail in vote, uh, do it, do it as soon as possible. Yeah, Scott, there's a number of deadlines for people to track. Uh, we've been posting those frequently on social media and on our website. So we'll continue to do that as we gear up towards election day. Uh, but again, only 18 days away before uh, people across the country begin to vote at the federal and state level. So it's coming fast and it's almost hard to believe that after all this buildup, uh, we're almost to the finish line. So uh, a lot more news to come in the election. I'm it's like sure. the build up to the Super Bowl and here we are. <laughs> it absolutely is. Yeah. But but without all the good commercials. <laughs> That's right. Very different commercials, to say <laughs> the least. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, Mark, uh, final topic of the day. It's that time of the year where KSB's legislative committee gets to work on its report, begins identifying its legislative positions, both at the state and federal level. It's been an ongoing process that you've been covering for a couple of months now, but our regional roundtables have wrapped up. And so where are we in the process of identifying and solidifying this year's priorities? Well, as probably most of you loyal viewers know, uh, in August, our legislative committee put out a, a kind of a first draft identifying what you might think of as our priority state issues. KSB has a booklet full of permanent policies that really tend not to change very much, and, and we, don't, we don't look to that changing uh, this year, their kind of core position, but we try to identify uh, kind of priorities. We've shared that. We presented that at the three regional roundtables. It's available on our website. It is available. We've, we've sent a number of, be in the newsroom, so look for that. Um, we're just gathering feedback on that first draft. We have a number of comments that came out of the regionals. We're going to share that with the committee when it meets on Saturday, November 7th. The committee will also start taking up its um, uh, kind of federal policies which again is something we usually kind of look to guidance from the National School Boards Association and we look to them do the same thing. So we just would say if any of you have concerns that you think we should look at as an association through our committee, uh, the process for them to vet it and, and ultimately go on to our delegate assembly, now is the time to give us that input. We certainly, and I, if we have a few moments to either take questions or, or oral comments, we have a fairly small group where you can put them in the chat or send them to us or on our website, on the advocacy tab, you can see the members of the committee, send the information to them. So they'll be doing in effect a second draft of the state issue report. Their first draft of federal issues, we'll send those out in November as soon as we can 
capture what the committee's work is. Those will be available at our uh, at our virtual convention and before, and we'll have some opportunities again for questions and input. And then the committee will take all that again and have a final set of recommendations that will go to a virtual delegate assembly that will be held on Thursday, January 21st. Um, because of the virtual nature of things and just some different approaches we wanted to take, the final vote on our legislative policies will actually take place after the legislature has already started. But the goal is to give us a little more time to kind of final interim committee reports, the governor's policy positions will all be known. And that'll be the opportunity for some last minute adjustments if we need to make them. So we just continue to say, please, please uh, follow what the committee is doing. And if you have input or think we're missing some important issues, we really want to hear that so the committee can consider them, put them out for you, and ultimately go before the delegate assembly. All right. Well, that's our full list of the rundown for today. A, a lot of information coming at you. So we do have some time. If anyone's got some questions, they can either jump on and ask those or drop them into the chat. Uh, while I give you a chance to uh, ask any of those questions or think through that, I'd be remiss if I didn't take Mr. Tallman's uh, tea there and uh, plug the 2020 annual convention for KASB. That is going to be December 2nd through 4th. We're doing it online as many groups are, uh, but we have a fantastic convention worked up for people, uh, including opportunities to learn more about the advocacy work we're going to be doing in 2021 and beyond, uh, as well as some fantastic keynotes, a delegate assembly there on Thursday afternoon. So if you haven't registered for that yet, please consider doing so. We'd love to see you in December at the 2020 convention. And I'm not seeing any questions coming through. Uh, if we jump off of here and you uh, have one pop into your head, of course, you can email us here at KSB and we'll do our best to get an answer to you. I appreciate everyone for joining us today. Uh, Mr. Tallman, do you have a question? My question is not a question, but Austin, wanna thank you. Uh, the, and, and maybe if, if people wanna give a comment, we appreciate your acting kind of as a moderator and allowing this to be more conversational. And I just wanna give a shout out for your work, the work of your team, if people have been noticing some of the changes in our communication, Austin's really been leading that. I think we're very pleased with the work we've seen. And even though today didn't go exactly as planned, uh, we are going to get there. And so uh, just on behalf of our, our advocacy team, I want to thank Austin and his team for the work they've done. And I think today uh, went very well, but we're always looking for feedback from, uh, from our membership. So we'd certainly appreciate that. So Austin, yeah. thank you. Well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. And we are absolutely always looking for feedback on how we can make these resources better. Uh, you can always share those with us and I'll throw into the chat a link to our evaluation and to our quick little survey. Only takes a couple of minutes, but gives you a chance to uh, share some feedback on how we offer resources to you. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. We apologize for uh, some maybe predictable in 2020 technology issues. Uh, we'll keep working on those and uh, Hopefully in two weeks, we're ready to go right at noon in the studio the way we had planned on it. All right. Thank you, everyone. Mark, Scott, Leah, appreciate your time. And Thanks we'll see you all soon.